take a look at some of the other aspects of valve maintenance that you'll need to know about. We'll see how a globe valve is taken apart, inspected, and how certain parts are repaired. And uh, we'll watch as it is reassembled once our maintenance work is finished. Well, we've cut away half of the body on this valve so that you can see the internal parts as we work on them. And the valve is braced in this vise to keep it from moving as we work. The first step is to loosen the nut on the hand wheel. Then the gland nuts on both sides and the bonnet nuts are loosened. Unscrew the gland nuts and remove them to relieve pressure on the packing. Now, unscrew the bonnet nuts and take them out. This will allow us to lift off the hand wheel and bonnet assembly. Remove the flexitalic gasket. The hand wheel is rotated in the closed direction as far as possible. And then the nut and the hand wheel are removed. Now we can rotate the stem out of the bonnet. If you're unable to turn the stem by hand, you can use a wrench to do it. And take care not to damage the stem with the wrench. A soft-faced wrench or a piece of soft material between the wrench and stem will help. Apply the wrench between the disc and back seat. If you should accidentally mar or nick the stem, it won't cause leakage when reinstalled, since it does not come in contact with the packing. But if you were to apply the wrench above the back seat or on a threaded portion of the stem and, and scratch it there, damage would result. The packing gland will come off as you rotate the stem. When the stem is out, the packing can be removed. Usually, the packing is taken out with a packing removal tool. With the stem out of the valve, the packing should come out easily. On this small valve, we can just turn it over and push the packing out. Now that the packing is removed, the bonnet and stuffing box can be cleaned and inspected. Check here for steam cuts or pits on the seating surface of the bonnet or body. If any are found, they must be repaired before the valve is reassembled. Minor damage can be handled by lapping the seating surfaces. Deeper cuts or pits may have to be machined on a lathe before they can be lapped. The lapping is performed in the following manner. To begin, put a small amount of lapping compound on the block. Usually, you would start with a coarse grade. Rotate the bonnet in a figure eight motion, being careful not to exert excessive pressure on the bonnet. A light downward pressure is best. In lapping, the weight of the part may provide enough pressure to smooth the surface. Now, wipe off the lapping compound and inspect the seating surface. Repeat this process as many times as necessary to remove the damage. While lapping, vary the compound grit. Use finer grades to give a smooth finish. When in leaking, this visual method is a rough check. For an accurate check, spotting in is used. And the first step in spotting in is to be sure that the disc is not free to rotate. During spotting in, it must not be allowed to rotate. To keep it from rotating, use a piece of shim stock. Another method is to put the shim stock between the disc and stem. To spot in a valve seat, apply a thin coating of Prussian blue evenly over the surface of the disc, using bluing that won't dry. After bluing the disc, put it into the valve and on the seat. 
rotate it one quarter of a full turn using a light downward pressure. Then take it out and look closely at the valve seat. A flashlight may be necessary to provide sufficient light. If proper contact was made, you'll see a thin blue line like this one. When you've finished inspecting the valve seat, wipe the disc and seat to remove the bluing. Then put a thin, even coat of bluing on the seat. Put the disc back into the valve, give it a quarter of a turn, again with a light downward pressure, and take out the disc. Now you can check the disc for proper seating. It should have a thin, unbroken line around it. If it doesn't, the disc and seat are not fitting properly. If there are imperfections to the disc or seat, you'll have to repair them. However, before repairing a disc or seat, check to see if these parts are designed for replacements. As in this example, the seat and disc are replaceable. If they are, it may be more economical to replace them than to spend the time making repairs. Let's say that you have decided to repair the damage. If you found minor imperfections on the disc and seat, you would use a method called grinding in to repair them. It's done by applying a small amount of lapping compound evenly to the disc and putting it into the valve and on the seat. The lapping compound should be changed frequently by removing all of the old compound from the disc and the seat. Then apply another thin coat. Rotate the disc back and forth over the seat using a light downward pressure. Move the disc forward one quarter turn occasionally to ensure even grinding in. Always be sure that the disc is tightly attached to the stem so that they both rotate together. If you can't keep them from moving separately, you'll have to use a lapping tool in place of the original disc and stem. However, this is referred to as lapping. Another type of disc is a gate valve disc with a flat seating surface. To repair a disc with a flat surface like this one, a lapping block can be used to remove minor imperfections. Lapping compound is applied to the disc, which is then put on the block and rotated in a figure eight motion using the same light downward pressure as before. You should inspect the disc often Remove all of the lapping compound and then make several strokes on the block. Inspect the disc closely. Dark spots indicate areas where the disc is not seating squarely. Now let's go over the lapping and grinding in processes again briefly. When the disc is rotated against the valve seat, it is called grinding in. And when the disc is rotated against another surface, the block, it is called lapping. Both processes use lapping compound. Lathes and reseating machines can be used to resurface a valve seat or disc. A lathe is generally preferable to a reseating machine, especially when repairing very hard metals such as stellite. This is because it takes less time to use a lathe and the cutting can be controlled better. Another part of the valve that should be inspected is the stem bushing. The threads of the stem rotate on the threads of the bushing to open and close the valve. For this reason, the stem bushing receives a lot of wear as the valve is operated. And when the bushing threads wear out on a rising stem valve, you can't close it anymore. System pressure will force it open. Well, check the bushing threads carefully. If they're worn, it's best to replace the bushing. Usually, the bushing will be tack welded in place and you'll have to use a hacksaw or file to remove the tack weld. The bushing can then be turned out with a wrench. The bushing threads are different from the stem threads, but when the valve is disassembled, this won't cause any problems in replacing the bushing. However, if the valve were in place with the bonnet attached, 
the stem would have to be rotated at the same time the bushing is being removed and threaded into the bonnet. If it's not done this way, the stem and bushing threads will bind and prevent you from installing the bushing. Well, the valve stem should also be checked at this time. It must be straight. A bent stem can cause excessive and rapid wear to the valve. Just a slight bend in the stem could render the valve inoperable, and it may also prevent the packing from sealing. To check the stem, place it on a lathe or V-block, as we have here. The total runout is checked with a dial indicator. The dial indicator is set up to touch the stem, and as the stem is rotated, the runout is indicated on the dial. If the dial remains constant on zero, the stem is straight. As you can see, this stem varies by about 10 thousandths. Well, you can also get a fair idea of whether the stem is straight by rolling it across the workbench. If it rolls smoothly without a bumpy motion, the stem is straight. As you look at the stem, there should be no space between the bench and stem. With the valve fully disassembled, all threaded surfaces should be cleaned thoroughly. A wire brush can be used for the large stem threads. The bolt and stud threads should be chased with a thread chaser. As we discussed earlier, this will make them easier to reassemble. Finally, inspect the flanges. The flanges of both the valve and pipe should be cleaned with a wire brush before inspection. You may need a putty knife to scrape hard to remove material. Be careful, however, not to nick or gouge the surfaces with the scraper, or it could cause leakage. Now, if there had been flange leakage while the valve was in service, repairs would be made in a similar way to those used to repair body-to-bonnet leakage. While the valve is out of the system and disassembled, you may want to sandblast the parts and then paint the exterior surfaces. This will help preserve the valve. With the cleaning and inspection complete, we are ready to reassemble this valve. Now, an important step in putting a valve back together after repairs are completed is lubrication. All moving and threaded parts should be well lubricated during assembly. Many lubricants, both wet and dry, are available, so be sure to use the appropriate type for each surface. Keep in mind what the valve will be used for. Well, once these parts are lubricated, Put the stem through the bonnet and slide the two-part packing gland over the stem. Then carefully thread the stem through the yoke bushing. Continue turning until the valve is near the full open position. Now we can put this assembly back on the valve body. First, set in the flexitalic gasket. Always use a new flexitalic gasket. Never reuse one which has been previously compressed. It will not seal properly. Put the valve on the seat. Replace the body to bonnet bolts and tighten them evenly to compress the gasket uniformly. Using a cross torque pattern, the manufacturer's manual will give you the proper torque value. Be sure to check the disc in the fully open position. This prevents the disc from being driven into the seat. When torquing the bonnet bolts, ensure the bonnet seats squarely on the body of the valve. Once the bonnet is installed, the valve can be packed. This is done the same way as when the valve is connected to the system. Finally, if the stem bushing has a grease fitting, be sure to grease the valve stem after completing the assembly. Well, that's it. The valve is now reassembled and ready to be put back into service. But well, we've been through a valve overhaul. We mentioned that it may be necessary to replace a valve if severely damaged. Several things should be considered when choosing a replacement valve. For example, the new valve must be the same type as the old valve and it should be rated for the same kind of service. Well, let's say that the damaged valve was rated for 150 pounds WOG. The replacement valve must be rated for at least the same service. However, it could have a higher service rating. 
The flanges on the new valve must also be the same size and type as those on the old valve, so that they'll fit the pipe the valve will be attached to. We looked at the techniques used to overhaul a globe valve. Now, I'd like to take a moment to talk about some of the differences you'll encounter in performing maintenance on gate valves. One of the main differences is the double seating surface that a gate valve has on the disc and seat. The disc can be removed and lapped on a block using the same procedures as we did when we lapped the bonnet of the globe valve. Now the seat on a gate valve is harder to repair than the seat on a globe valve. It must be removed before it can be lapped or replaced. If the seat on a gate valve is non-replaceable and too damaged to be repaired, the entire valve must be replaced. Finally, unlike on the globe valve, the seat and disc of a gate valve cannot be ground or spotted in. Well, these are the main differences in maintenance that you will find between the gate valve and the globe